Hello, podcast listeners. Fair warning, there is some strong language in this podcast, so you might want to be aware of small children listening to this, uptight adults, or any other creatures that might be offended by a few strong words. Uh, We'll warn you every time, and the first one is coming up in the intro, but you'll be safe after a minute. Five, four, three, two, Somebody's heart. one, zero. Hello and welcome. You're going to need a bigger boat. Oh, 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 oh. And now, on with the show. Welcome to the Fish Nerds Podcast. It is the latest about fish, fishing, and eating fish. I am Dave. I and I, yeah, you sure are, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> and I am Clay. Together, we talk about fishy stuff that's happened to us, people we know, and other fish nerds we've seen. Anything is fair game. It's a good bet that Dave will get bored of this podcast because we've already recorded this once. <laughs> <laughs> Damn you, technical difficulties! Uh, we, we, we recorded this podcast the entire, in its entirety, and I did not push the record button on my uh, <laughs> my computer, so we've got to redo the whole thing, so bear with us. <laughs> Clay and I have an, a, uh, an undocumented contest to see which one of us can screw up the most. And, uh, oh, yeah. You know, we're neck and neck right now, I think. It's close, man. I hope I win. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got god-awful chum barrels. It's awful. Full of things to talk about today. <laughs> Mainly, we're going to talk about our shark fishing trip. Man, that was a good trip. That was a good trip. You know, I was uh, I was going over some of the audio that we took today, and uh, that that was full, chock full of things from the very beginning to the very end. There were there was good stories all through it, and we're going to cover that here today. Yeah, and we'll delete all the bad stories. That's right, because uh, <laughs> those happened too. <laughs> they did. <laughs> but it was it was a fabulous trip. Thanks again to Captain Sean Tibbetts and the crew of the Miss Megan Two for making that whole adventure possible. They took us out to the very site where the Miss Megan One sank. I know, spooky. It's very exciting. I know it was haunted. <laughs> haunted with god awful chum. God. <laughs> it's awful. And we're also uh, going to, of course, do Stump the Fish Nerds and Fish in the News. Mm. And full show, Dave. And what was that? It's a full show. It is a full show. There's lots. Of, we, we should get right to it. Hey, Mr. Tallyman, tally me bananas. <laughs> Where are the bananas at? <laughs> That's the question mm. when you get on Sean Tibbetts, Captain Sean Tibbetts' boat. Please call him Captain. He does not take kindly to disrespect. <laughs> he doesn't take, yes, he doesn't take yeah. kindly to, to several things. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> and you know, it's, it's an intimidating thing meeting, uh, you know, other fishermen, uh, a captain. Um, he's an ex-Marine. He flies the Marine flag, I think, off the boat. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, you don't know what you're getting into. Right? He, the guy is uh, shot as much more uh, manly than I think, yes. I think than Dave and I combined. <laughs> and and when you're yes. a fish nerd, <laughs> when you're a fish nerd, I, it doesn't take a lot for you to be intimidated by guys who are really gruff and tough. You know, these are the <laughs> these guys can kill you with, with just one finger. You know, because we don't, yeah, we're just exactly. afraid. But it was great. We got to the we got to the docks at six in the morning, which for Sean is late in the day, right? Uh, and and we didn't know what to do. The boat is down a really long, steep gangplank. It's probably a forty five degree angle. I mean, really. Well, it, it's not steep, steep if the tide is in, right? Because it's it must be like an eight foot tide there. I, I who knows? But it was steep when we got there. I mean, it was re- incredibly steep. And Dave's great because Dave has this giant like duffel bag <laughs> with it, one of those like retractable handles on it, and it looked like it's packed for like three days. Yeah, because you know? I because I had I was you know bringing all the video equipment, audio equipment, yeah. um, extra change of clothes, your work you know, laptop. 
a white work laptop yeah. made it. Yeah. Yes, a bunch of bananas. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm trying to go down this steep incline, and of course the handle breaks off. At this well, it's great because right? not only does it break off, like you're trying to get down the boat, like you know what you're doing. I'm gonna, I got this. I'm gonna just walk down the incline, and <laughs> everything falls apart. <laughs> it's like so, yeah. like, and then, and then Sean comes running up the docks. Picks up your bag, throws it on his shoulder, and runs back to the boat, like it's yes. nothing. And yes. you know, you're meanwhile you're holding both rails and you're shaking, trying not to fall down <laughs> as you walk down that <laughs> incline to the boat. <laughs> so yeah, it was not an auspicious beginning no. to the uh, no. to the trip. <laughs> the first thing after we got to the boat and we we met uh, Ryan and is it Bob and uh, and uh, yeah, Bob Bob's his dad. Bob's dad and Benji, the mate. Uh, yep. The the first thing Sean said, before he didn't even shake our hand yet. Right. You got bananas? <laughs> Banana check. He checks all the bags for bananas. Guys, yes. like most uh, most captains of ships, very superstitious. And, you know, Dave and I are laughing. We have no idea where this comes from, the whole banana. Do you know the story of the banana, bananas? I, I believe I researched it once. What is it? And it has it has something to do with... And actually, I think it goes back to the slave trade times, and when ships are coming up from Jamaica and all this, and they're they're trading with god awful, you know, the slavery trade, but also fruits and things. Mm-hmm. And I guess there was some bad things that happened to boatloads of bananas mm-hmm. uh, that that made maritime history. And like a peel, a, deal. a peel fell on the deck, and then That's... the captain <laughs> fell down and broke his leg and had a wooden leg put on. I mean, what like what could possibly have happened with bananas? <laughs> He wasn't joking. He was not joking. So, and I, I was wondering about this. So, if you ate a banana and you have a banana in your gut, right? Because you've eaten this banana. Mm-hmm. What, what's the, what's the laws on that? I'm pretty sure if we had told Sean, "Hey, don't worry, I already <laughs> ate a banana," he would have punched us right in the stomach, <laughs> and we would have barfed up the banana. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I, right. I am I am pretty sure that would have been the outcome. <laughs> <laughs> so uh so yeah so there was a big search on that and then he gives his safety spiel and um you know we've all experienced the safety spiel oh, i forgot on, about this on an airplane uh-huh. right you haven't experienced a safety spiel until you've heard captain sean tibbetts give a safety, on a shark safety boat. spiel <laughs> on a shark boat yeah. uh very matter of fact uh he was talking about this yellow box mm-hmm. and uh he basically said if the boat goes down he, we all have to fight him for this yellow box. <laughs> and whoever gets to the yellow box first has to strap this frickin' thing on your arm. He didn't use frickin'. Um, and, and the idea is that so then if you die or something, at least this, this pinger, this, and I guess it's, it must be a, like a Coast Guard pinger. Yeah, it's a GPS GPS thing um, it will be operating but uh, he said and then <laughs> and so he said you know you do that and, it, and if he dies then Benji will get it if Benji dies then it, it's up to one of us um, and then he talked about this the life raft that is on top of the boat and which is heavier than any of us could pick up right. Did, didn't he idea, say Wait till the boat sinks and before you try to get to life, like like yes. the, the lifeboat. So he said you have we, nobody can lift it. So just wait till it sinks and then you pop it open. Ah oh, man! So you're treading water that you've been chumming in all day for for <laughs> sharks, <laughs> and then you gotta like wait. <laughs> okay, shark sinking. I see boat sinking. I see shark fins. Oh boy. Okay. I got a yellow. Hey. I got a yellow box strapped. I got to the my yellow arm. box. He's got Dave's leg. It's okay. It's not my leg. <laughs> oh, good. The boat sank. We're saved. Oh, yes. I'm saved. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> so anyway, it was a very, um, it was a very eye-opening experience getting on the boat. Yeah. Hello, chum. Hello, chum. <laughs> chum on a shark fishing boat is is interesting, and Sean loves his chum. He loves it. He, he called me the day before, and he goes, hey, Clay, guess what? I got 30 gallons of chum on my boat for you. 30 gallons. 
And I'm like, 30, what, what on planet do you need 30 gallons of chum? I have no idea. Like, it just sounds like so much grossness. Oh, and then we get on board and they have this, this jug of what looks like apple juice. Yes. And it turns out to be what they term Menhaden milk. Yeah, man, yeah, it's like fish oil. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's yeah. nowhere near milk. I don't know. No, no, but they kept offering it to me as apple juice. I know, I know. Yeah, and I, ne- uh, I never once went for it. <laughs> but they would. Uh, they had a basically a um, a basket hanging off the back of the boat. It looked like, like a laundry a, basket. It was a laundry basket. Yeah, just a cheap old laundry basket. And they would pour buckets and buckets of chum and mix it up with a uh, big canoe paddle. Yeah, well, my favorite was, like, every time they opened the chum buckets, Sean would go, Oh, it's terrible! Oh, God, it's awful! Uh, oh, wait, do you smell this? And it was almost like it didn't matter if it smelled or not. He was determined to make sure we knew how <laughs> awful it was. Uh, he gets his chum from commercial fishing boats. So it's literally the guts and entrails from whatever fish happened to be uh, processed that day. Yes, and so um, really foul stuff. Yes, foul stuff. Um, and he reported that he was getting because he was getting ready for a shark fishing tournament right. that was happening that weekend. Right. And he had ordered fifty-five gallons of fish guts. Mm. So um, there you go. Yeah. What do you suppose one pays for that much gut? You know, he he mentioned numbers for both the Menhaden milk and the chum. Yeah. That was uh, like like multiple hundreds of dollars. That's what I thought too. I thought, man, that's a lot of chum money. It, it's a lot of chum money, and uh, <laughs> yeah, he uh, he definitely did it right for us. And his chum recipe was good. And he also mentioned during as he was preparing for the shark fishing tournament that they would do the fifty five gallons of chum, and they were going to mix in herring scales. Yes. Which I thought was pretty interesting. Yeah, we probably get that like flaky, sparkly water. Exactly. So they're, they're yeah. just like when herring in a school get hit by tuna and bluefish, there are a bunch of scales in the water. So they're they're really imitating those. So yeah, and, and I don't know if we're giving anything away by telling his chum recipe, but uh, he would take this these guts and pour them in the basket off the boat, and then he would add some of that man. What do you call it? Man? What milk? Manhaden uh, milk. Manhaden milk. And then he had a little tiny bottle of, like, BioEdge or some kind of additional, like, enzyme that he would add to it to kind of push it over the top. <laughs> and he was, was very, very proud of his recipe. <laughs> and he, he, we chummed forever. <laughs> forever. And at one point, you look off the back of the boat, and when chum is in the ocean and in the water, it, it makes us slick because all the oil and you can, it actually smooths the water out. Mm-hmm. And you could just see this miles, for as far as you could see, this winding trail of fish oil. It was amazing. They said it, it, they, it was like 10 miles of I was going to say 8 or 10 miles long. It was just crazy big chum trail. And I can't imagine how, like, how many schools of mackerel were just in that chum slick. Yes. And what was really interesting is when the mackerel would show up, um, we had uh, sabiki rigs in the water most of the day. And boy, when they showed up, you had them. You know, they was like, boom, 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 boom. Eight at a time. Right. And then they would disappear. Yeah. They would not stay near the boat. Yeah. And uh, They were scared of something bigger. Yeah, exactly. It was very, very interesting. So, mm-hmm. um, But it was always fun when the mackerel showed up because we would, we would bring in mackerel, like Clay said, eight at a time. And they would, um, they would take a big live one and throw it on a hook. And get it out for shark, and then bag all the rest of them to sell to the bait guy, right? They, or not they, sell, but trade, give, I guess. I think they trade, yeah. But the cool thing is, like, so we fished. We were on the water, floating out there for about seven hours, eight hours. Right. Like, real long time. And my favorite thing is we would, the, the schools of mackerel would come in, and Dave and I would both catch six or eight at a time. <laughs> and then we had guests on the boat, Ryan and Bob. And we're like, hey, Bob, come on over here and try this. And th- I can see the fish in the water. <laughs> and I know if I'm holding that rod, I'm pulling six or eight at a time out. As soon as we hand Ryan or Bob the rod, nothing. I know. Nothing. But yeah, those, those were very skittish, very skittish mackerel. Yeah. And we, um, uh, yeah, 
Oh, that was fun, though. I was catching mackerel. <laughs> I could do that all day. I know. I know. I, I, I could do that, too. So, yeah. Chum. That's chum. the story of Chum. Hello, podcast listeners. In this next section, we run some audio of the fish being caught. Uh, there is some strong language, so once again, kids, cranky adults, be fair warned. You'll be okay after the 20 minute mark. So, the catching of the fish. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know if you saw this, Dave, but it, I was standing in the in the stern of the boat with Captain Sean. And were you right there with me, or were you up near the center of the boat? I, I was I was up near the center of the boat. I was working on um, I think audio stuff, but yeah, I was I was sitting up inside the the cabin kind of thing. Yeah, well, you were. I mean, I'm glad you were there because you were there to turn on <laughs> to turn on the microphone, right? <laughs> but. But I was standing in the back of the boat. Sean was pacing like a maniac. <laughs> like he was starting to get he was just a little bit crazy about the fact that we didn't catch any sharks. And he was so sure that we would be out catching, you know, 30 to 40 blue sharks, you know, on, on that day. Um, so he was like, you know, we're like, it's the end of the day. He has, he has a, no, he has a night job, right? Right. So he has to get back and drive a tow truck. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, we got to go because I'm going to be late for work. You know, when we're still two hours in the middle of the ocean. Uh, and so he starts to clean up and pack up. And we had, uh, that we were using, so we had these uh, balloons that we had drawn pictures on floating off the boat. We had one about four feet off the stern of the boat. And then we had, you know, 20 feet, 40 feet, 70 feet, whatever it was, just spread out. And the one nearest the boat I had set, and I tried to draw the word nerds on a fish and put it in the water right there. So I think that was lucky. <laughs> because just when Sean had about quit, the the uh, balloon closest to the boat went underwater. Oh. And I went, oh, 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 Sean, Sean, Sean. Uh, and then it, and it, po- it popped up. And then a couple seconds later, it felt longer than that, it went under for good. Foof, gone. <laughs> uh, and then, it, Sean was very calm. Yeah. I think he's thinking something small. And he grabs the line with his gloves on, and he walks the, the line around to the very, very back of the boat, and he goes, you know, this fish doesn't even know it's hooked yet. <laughs> <laughs> and then he grabs the line and gives it a swift yank to set the hook with yeah. his bare hands, you know, well, with his gloved hands. On, just, but not using the rod, just, just holding the string. Right, because because that's how Sean does things. Just yeah. that's how he does things. Well, I think he handed the rod the rod off to Ryan at this point already. Because my brain has mixed up some of the details here. Right, and you know, so I think Ryan was getting set up, and I think uh, Benji was starting to pick up some of the other gear off the back of the boat to get it out of the way and pulling some of the other lines. And so, yeah, so, so Sean says, this thing ha- doesn't even know he's hooked yet. And he sets the hook. And all of a sudden goes, he knows it now. And then. <laughs> well, hold on, hold on. We have yeah. audio of that you particular audio. moment. Oh, good. And you, you can hear, you can hear uh, what Clay was describing. And then you can hear the reaction of us with what happened next. So let let's let's just listen to the audio and then, then we can we can hear this. Every five minutes. Oh, there we go. Hold on, you just hit it. Come here, you fucker. Hit it again. Here we go. Ben, get a belt. Right there, ben. Yep. Good belt. He doesn't know he's hooked yet. He doesn't know he's hooked yet. Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> oh, God! Oh, God! You want this one out of the way? All right, hold on. So, to work this... Oh, oh, shit! Oh, 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 yeah. Wow! Now. Holy shit! Oh, 
All right, so. <laughs> does, does that capture the, the chaos? <laughs> it does capture the chaos. And it captures the moment when we all realize what had what what was going to happen. Yeah. Uh, so, well, what happened <laughs> was this, this six and a half foot fish jumped out of the water next to the boat. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right. It was crazy. It was like something out of like a movie, like a Discovery Channel movie. It was amazing. And then, so the, the, this this Mako shark jumped out of the water. It, it probably came 10 feet out of the water and did a full flip. Yeah. And then landed back in the water, you know, obviously back, hopefully back in the water again. Right. <laughs> but it was very close to the boat. And, you know, Dave, I felt this visceral urge to dive off the boat and swim away. <laughs> and it was so, like, in your soul scary. Like, that <laughs> fight and flight response. And you know me, I'm a big wuss. I have no fight response. <laughs> I only have flight. <laughs> you know, like, if you and I were ever in a situation where someone was threatening us, yeah. you'd be dead meat. I'd just run away. <laughs> I got nothing here, so I wanted to get out of the way as fast as I could. <laughs> it was it was really amazing. The thing jumped once clear out of the water, jumped twice clear out of the water, and I think jumped a third time, but by that time, everybody was scrambling. Yeah, well, you know, we're looking to get the fishing rods out of the way. I'm desperate to get my camera, my GoPro turned on, but Sean's yelling at us to get all the gear out of the way. Right. And- so we didn't get video of this thing jumping, and I so wish we'd had. I mean, it was so amazing. It was, yes. <laughs> yeah. But I think without Sean yelling and screaming at us, we wouldn't have known what to do at all. Yeah, we would have just <laughs> been, like, jumping around in, in place going, oh, boy. Yeah. You know how – you remember when you were a little kid, Dave, and, you're, and your parents are yelling at you, come on, pick up the pace, hurry up, let's go, go, we're going to be late. And you start blinking your eyes and shaking your head, like, that makes you go faster. Right. <laughs> and, like, you can't remember the detail. That's how I feel about that whole sec- the few seconds of time. It's like <laughs> I was just blinking my eyes and shaking my head and, like, boom, 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 like a strobe light of time went by. Yeah, it was crazy, yeah. and then and then the fight then the fight ensued, and um, yeah. so Ryan was was all strapped in, kind of. I can't imagine what's going through his mind at this point because uh, he seems so happy. <laughs> yeah, and and it's this this shark is just ripping off line and going I don't know hundred yards behind the boat probably easily easily, and he got to the backing several times on his uh, on his reel. Wow, it was it was yeah. really impressive, and I was. I was hoping it was going to jump. I had the camera all ready. If that thing was going to jump again, which I assumed it was going to after those initial jumps. Yeah, it didn't. <laughs> it didn't. And it uh it was a few splashes, but no real jumps again. Yeah, it it kept low. Um mm-hmm. and then uh he was able to uh, you know, real fight, real fight. And then uh he he started to get tired, so then it was like, "All right, so we're going to switch somebody out. We'll get his dad all lined up." So his dad Well, hey, all- before that happened, he had reeled the fish all the way to the boat. We had because I have this on I have this on video. I didn't put the whole thing up because it's just too long. But Ryan had reeled the the shark all the way, maybe within four feet of the stern of the boat. They had the the uh, spear and everything ready to go, and then the shark just did a big run, <laughs> just for the ever run, like just straight out. Uh, and that's and then a few minutes after that, that's when they switched off because it was we thought, man, that's it. Like the, uh, the video is funny to watch if you watch the whole thing. You have patience for it, but <laughs> that one, that one big thing. Wow, that was easy, and then it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, and then his dad got switched out, and then you got the belt on as being oh, on. I, I couldn't wait to feel. I just, I didn't want to catch the fish for them or anything like that. I wanted to feel just for a minute. To, to feel that fish. Yeah. Because I've never felt anything like that. It kind of like, oh, I just want, to, just want to hold it for a minute, you know. <laughs> and but, it was funny because I was standing next to you and I was uh, <laughs> I was watching you shout encouragement. You're like, okay, you know, you know, if you need a break, come right here, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah, anytime, Bob, you can quit. You know, <laughs> okay, Bob, you're doing great. Just, you're doing great. But, you know, if you if, yeah. if you need a break, holler. I'm he ready. did not need a break. <laughs> 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 he did not need a break. He just... He didn't make a sound. He yeah, I know. He was just reeling in. Break that in. fish in. Arr, arr, arr. Yeah. And then, and then the shark came in, and that's when you're glad you have a marine on the boat. Yes. Uh, <laughs> on yelling orders. Yes. And uh, Benji gets the harpoon ready to go. 
Mm-hmm. And I think Benji was the one that, that threw it, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, and you know, the funny thing about that harpoon, did you see the, the, the tip of that thing? Yes. It's a dull piece of copper, it looks like. I know. It's ridiculous. Like it's, you... it's like softly rounded on all the edges. I'm like, that can't do any damage. But sure enough, it's all you need, I guess. I know. And so the, they slam the back of this uh, or this harpoon in the shark and the, the end comes off and has a rope attached to it. That's right. And they tied it to the clear of the boat. But as soon as they did that, the, the shark came off the hook. Wow. Yeah, so at that point, if they didn't have that in there well, that would have been it. Yeah, they would have lost it. Yep. Yeah. Because uh, as soon as they did that, something happened. Hook popped out of the shark's mouth. <laughs> Unreal. And, and yeah, and then, you, you know, they get the lines out of the way. They fight this fish with just a rope now. And they get a rope around its tail. Right. Uh, and that's when it's done. It's all over. Yep. And uh, But then they also got a big, nasty gaff. The biggest gaff I think I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> God. <laughs> and they jam it like through the mouth up through the eye. I mean, there was nothing happening <laughs> once this gaff mm. got in this fish. Uh, I, yeah, that's another, another video I didn't quite uh, share properly. <laughs> but that is, I just, it's so, it's, I, you know, I can't keep going back to this, or I don't know if I told, said this or not yet, but like, I mean, fishing is a violent, violent act. <laughs> yeah. And you just take all your fishing and you magnify that up. You know, five hundred times, and that's shark fishing. Yeah, you know, it's just it's just closer. It's bigger. It's violent, sir. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I, I was yeah. catching white perch yesterday, and as I was bringing them in and unhooking them, I'm like, oh my god! Just the simple act of like bringing a fish in and, and getting it subdued <laughs> when mm-hmm. when you ramp it up from a half pound to two hundred twenty pounds. Uh, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. <laughs> It was really cool. It was it was a neat experience, and uh, I mean, I mean, honestly, like top notch as far as knowing what Sean was doing. He was, I, I can't imagine anyone doing a better job of landing that fish. No, he he did it. He did it perfect, and he knew he had something special. You know, obviously, right away when it jumped out of the water, and yeah, uh, yeah he did everything perfect. It was amazing. It was amazing. Yeah. So after we finally got <laughs> after we finally got the fish uh, subdued and uh, Captain Sean uh, was able to relax and his ma- his manicness <laughs> subsided a little bit, he still had this crazed ferret look in his eye. <laughs> he did have a crazed ferret, <laughs> didn't he? Like this little tiny beady glint, <laughs> and he walks up to me and he grabs me by the sides of my cheeks. With his sloppy shark gutting <laughs> gloves on, right? He's, you know how much fish has he handled and chum has he handled? Yeah, go on, awful. grabs me hard by my cheeks and presses against my head, and then, I that point I realize I'm about to get kissed, <laughs> and I I have nowhere to run to. I'm cornered with a guy who's much stronger and macho than me, and I just and he kissed me square in the mouth. Yeah, yep. And it was wet and sloppy, <laughs> and I, I I didn't feel any tongue, but I, I felt like it was about to happen, uh, and it tasted like mackerel. Oh, <laughs> and he held the he held my head there for a long time. Well, yeah. a really really long time. <laughs> but I, I gotta say, it's my first time kissing a man, uh, and uh, and I, I don't like it. <laughs> Oh, man. Oh, man. Uh, and his mate, Benji, just stood behind him laughing until he was almost crying. And, and I'm like, I'm wondering how many times Benji's been kissed by Sean. And he's like, finally, finally, someone else gets to take the kiss. And it was me. And I and, and uh, I go, Captain Sean was right. It was damn funny. But uh, I, I didn't like yeah, it. it was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, if I were stronger and a little more macho, uh, I would have swam away. Well, it was <laughs> it was a, it was swept up in the moment, right? I mean, this l- yeah. lifetime shark being caught with the fish nerds. There was mm-hmm. hardly anything else that could have been done. So, you know, Dave, I've caught lots of um, uh, <laughs> lots of lifetime fish hanging out with you. And I got to be honest, I've never once even thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to kiss Dave. 
never even. In fact, the idea is repulsive. <laughs> uh, you're like, I'm shocked that your wife kisses you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Me too. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, but man. I guess it turns out the fish nerds are very, very kissable. <laughs> I guess so. You know? I guess so. Keep that in mind. <laughs> Gonna make a new shirt, kiss a fish nerd. Uh, and then, yeah. and then you planted one on the uh, on the Mako. I kissed the Mako. Yes. Yeah. But that was uh, Luke. Uh, Luke, our fish nerds correspondent from uh, Australia. Good day, mate. He 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 did not have any faith in us catching a mako, <laughs> and he bet me twenty bucks I wouldn't kiss one. Yeah, so there you yeah. go, done. And I did done. <laughs> it's me twenty bucks. <laughs> you know, but twenty dollars Australian. I don't know what that means. Yeah, he, he's gonna he's like gonna pull peso. some funky currency exchange yeah. on you. Yeah, it's not gonna make any sense. It's gonna be like two wallabies <laughs> and a wombat. Yeah, yeah, and they're all gonna have little pouches in them. Yeah. They're going to be marsupial money. (laughs) Money that comes with its own purse. That's right. It can hold itself. (laughs) So real quick, we both had strong feelings about the killing of the fish uh, when Mm -hmm. it came in. And it wasn't our call. Ryan, the winner of the trip, knew he had a lot of people who were – excited about or would be excited about mako shark steaks it was a fish of a lifetime um we both commented that we're not sure what we would have done in the heat of the moment um but so so the fish had to be killed and it just reminded us of how how graphic (laughs) i guess uh eating is right because normally we have somebody else kill something and then we eat it yeah, I mean, it really makes you closer to the food, you know. And I can, and I doing it and being involved with it, I can understand why, why some people choose never to do it. I get that. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think we're still processing it all because there's a world of difference between catching a bluegill and catching a six foot, two hundred twenty pound mako Which shark. Which is catching, killing. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, we'll yeah. we'll leave it at that. And um, it was certainly memorable. And it's, mm-hmm. it's certainly a eye-opening experience. So when we pulled into the dock, all sorts of paparazzi rock star stuff happened. We were heroes. We were. There was the ubiquitous boat full of drunk people that are apparently at mm-hmm. every marina. Well, that's because they're not allowed to drive anymore, so they sit in the boat drinking. <laughs> I think you're right. They piled yeah. out of a boat and uh, were all over this fish. It was, it was obnoxious. I, I'll, I'll go ahead and say it. It was obnoxious. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, Absolutely. The shark was pulled from the boat and was hanging, you know, the classic hanging on the dock as people... Uh, get pictures with it and as soon as it was brought up this drunk guy jumps in and says hey take a picture of me and the shark and and puts his arm around the shark yeah pretend i caught this thing i'm awesome it was painful it was was so obnoxious i think we were all a little shocked of how obnoxious it was i was surprised that uh captain sean put up with that i know like he was so gruff and so crazy (laughs) uh i was shocked that he put up with that but it's also tough because there's a huge audience there. There's kids there. There's, you know, there's lots of stuff going on. So, luckily, the drunk guy um, didn't last long. Didn't stay long. Nope. And uh, and then we we finally got our our pictures taken with the uh, with the shark. It's always I think it's important to take pictures because um, it's absolutely. It, I, I still looking back. We didn't take nearly enough good pictures. I know. Believe me, I know. Yeah. And uh, I wish I had my hands on the shark more. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, it was everything was moving so fast, and the shark was dangerous all the way up until right when they were cutting it up. And even then, it was kind of dangerous. Even even then, yeah, for sure. And um, But anyway, there was just crowds and crowds of people. And the nice thing about it, there was so much shark, 220 pounds. I think we, we figured it out. It was like $4,000 worth of shark, right, on the... Yeah, a ton of good. I think four thousand might be an exaggeration, but um, <laughs> that sounds like tuna fish pricing there. But uh, 
but yeah, I mean the market value at eighteen dollars a pound for shark steaks. I guess you're not far off. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I mean two twenty is the whole fish. So yeah, you do have to throw away the stuff that isn't people normally don't eat. But um, yeah, but the shark had a remarkable. You remember, there's no bones in these things, right? They're all yeah. It's either cartilage or meat. Yeah. And so when you have it, it is mostly meat. And Sean was carving off these like ten pound roast sized pieces of shark. And he put them on the table, and they keep moving. Yeah, I know. You know some <laughs> some neuron is firing or something, and they're just oozing around the table and just. It was something else. It, it was a horror show. It was, <laughs> um, but it was also once again really fascinating. And there was a woman from uh, the main division of marine fisheries. I'm sorry, marine mm-hmm. resources there, and her name was Amy E. Hamilton Vilea. 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 She, she, in her email, Vilea. she spelled it phonetically, sort of. And we're, so we're trying to but get it right. But she didn't get the, the phonetics are still wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we're sticking by Amy Hamilton Vilea. And uh, Vilea. she had some great stuff to say. She, she's experienced <laughs> some of the sharks out there this season. And she's been there for several years uh, working on this and some of the research that they're doing. So the fish we brought in was a mako. A short fin mako. Short fin mako. Yes. How, how common is that when they come in? It's rare to bring one in. There are plenty out there in the ocean, but they're really difficult to hook. And that's the first shark that I've measured this year. Wow. It's certainly the first mako, but it's even the first shark I've measured this year. What other kind of fish do you see coming into the port here? Um, so... So the other fish that I'm targeting with my survey is bluefin tuna. Yeah. So sometimes those are landed here as well. Uh-huh. But the charter captains and the private boats here, they're normally targeting striped bass, yeah. uh, bluefish, uh-huh. also Atlantic mackerel. Um, sometimes they ground fish. In that case, they're looking for Atlantic cod, haddock, um, white hake, pollock, redfish, cusp. Um, and yeah, that's, those are the main species that they're targeting. Excellent. Yep. Excellent. So there's a pretty broad range that's brought in here, but sharks are rare. And, and the reason the department is doing is collecting the data at the dock, uh, why, why are they doing that? So the survey I'm doing today is a federal survey. It's for the National Marine Fisheries Service. It's conducted in every coastal state. It's called the Large Pelagics Survey. Um, large Pelagics refers to species that um, live in the open ocean, what we're called the pelagic area. They're highly migratory, which means that they travel all the oceans of the world. They're not found in a particular region, and that's why they're managed federally. And in fact, a lot of the species are managed internationally. There's a union of countries that meets regularly to decide what the regulations should be and try to monitor the population. So well, that, that makes total sense, right? Because the fish don't know political boundaries. They right. don't know state, right. state Particularly regulations. Particularly these kinds of fish. They have huge ranges. Mm. And yeah, they can be found anywhere. Are, are there any other neat projects that you and your colleagues are doing in the uh, marine fisheries? Um, so we do this large pelagic survey, yeah. which in the state of Maine targets mostly tuna and shark fishermen. Mm-hmm. We have a few swordfish fishermen, but that's not a big fishery here. Yeah. So the other survey that we do is a general recreational survey for every saltwater species. Anyone who recreationally fishes, fishes maybe ask that survey. Yep. Um, and that's also done, it's also a federal survey done in every coastal state. Um, so we, for that one, we survey people fishing from shore, so from beaches, jetties, people fishing from their own boats, uh, charter customers, and also head boat customers. So that's another big part of what I do as well. Oh, that's excellent. Well, I know all the anglers thank you for all your work that you're doing out here because, you know, making the resource available to everybody. So that's that's the goal. Really appreciate that. Yep. So, well, thanks a lot. And yeah, you're welcome. And and uh, good job. Okay. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. So, so that was Amy talking about uh, some of the work that the main Department of Marine Resources is doing. So, uh, we're keeping Amy in the Rolodex because she's smarter, way smarter than us, and she has way more experience than us. So, and, the, and part of the trick to having to being a good fish nerd is having nerdier fish nerds around <laughs> that you can go to when you don't know the answer. That's right. So she's yeah. in the Rolodex. Watch out, Amy. We'll probably get you on future shows as well. And on the way home, Dave and I decided we to go get a beer. <laughs> and we, we go into this kind of like this, this Irish pub. It was very strange. Uh, it was, it was a very strange place. Second story bar, and uh, we were t- the waitress. Oh, the waitress, the bartender. What did 
Do you remember this exchange, Dave? Yes. Yeah, so, so the bartender was coming on a shift right when we showed up. That's right. And she was introduced to us as our future ex-wife. That's right. <laughs> hey, Clay, this is your future ex-wife. I'm like, oh, good. Oh, God. <laughs> And I, I can't remember her name, but it would it would be uh, something like could. Lola. It would be something yeah, like that. Yeah, had to be. Had to be. And yeah. uh, she, she was kind of grumpy and <laughs> gruff, and I liked her. I know. She was she was not friendly, um, nope. except she was friendly in that non-friendly way. Yeah, like it was part of her shtick. Right, exactly. Like, yeah. So, uh, but, but we were telling her about our shark fishing trip, and she goes, oh, I love shark. And so... You know, while you were paying the bill, I ran down to the car and I carved off about, you know, three or four pounds of shark meat. <laughs> and I tipped her in raw shark. Yes, she loved and it. And she was, she was so happy. I got a huge hug. Yep. And uh, I almost had a new girlfriend. <laughs> That's true. It was just three or four pounds of shark. So, yeah, I know. Imagine, imagine if you gave her the whole roast. I'll tell you what, if I knew about sharks in high school, it would have been a very different experience for this nerd. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have been walking down the hall with pockets full of shark meat going, hey, baby, is that a shark in my pocket? You bet it is. <laughs> you know, something tells me it, wasn't, it wouldn't have been that big a difference for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're probably right. <laughs> One can dream, but uh, but anyway, <laughs> it was certainly a memorable bar stop tipping with Mako Shark. Yeah, really good idea. <laughs> Highly recommend tipping with fresh seafood any chance you get. <laughs> Stomp. The Fish Nerds. Stump the Fish Nerds. We like Stump the Fish Nerds because... Love it. It doesn't happen enough. It doesn't. And uh, we love it when people pitch questions to us and we field them like a outfielder fields a ball. <laughs> I, I, I know we said this before, but, you know, Dave, making sports analogies for people who don't know about sports does not make sense. <laughs> But anyway, we, we, we are happy to take Stump the Fish Nerd questions. Clay, read the one that we got this week. First of all, if you would like to play Stump the Fish Nerds, you can call 607-378-FISH. 607-378-FISH. Leave us a voicemail on the Fish Nerds hotline. We'll play your Stump the Fish Nerds on the show, and then we will answer it. And so far, we are unstoppable. And this one comes from from our friend Jason Angel, who happens to be a supporter of our show on Patreon. Uh, and he says, I don't know where he's from. Uh, he says, hey guys, I got to stump the fish nerds for you. I recently saw a picture on a fishing guide's Facebook page of a blue catfish they caught that was solid white with dark, not red eyes. Do you know what caused this? Now, on its face of it, on the surface, that's a great question. Yes. But then his, he has a qualifier. <laughs> I'm 99.99% sure I know, but do you? So now <laughs> now he's just testing us. Yeah, he's just playing he, with us. He doesn't want to learn anything. He just wants to, to see if we know stuff. Well, it is called Stump the Fish. Like, it is set up as a challenge. Yeah, well, bring it on. Yeah, bring it on. Because we have Google machines. <laughs> <laughs> Although this one, I must admit, in all honesty... We didn't mm -hmm. need it initially, I don't believe. Uh, no, although we both have a different answer. Yeah, we do. And uh, yeah. I don't know how we, we, we break this tie, you know, how we prove that I'm right and Clay's wrong. Um, I, I'm going to just trust that I'm wrong. I'm good at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, my thought was I, too, have paid attention to animals that show up clear, uh, pure white. I've seen white raccoons, pictures of them, not in person, but white raccoons, white this, white that. And they don't have the red eyes, the creepy albino red eyes, right? Like a, like a white rat, lab rat does. And which means they're not albinos. And uh, therefore, lucidic, luciism is what it is. And it's a lack of pigment, not only just melanin, which is the uh, albino trait, the genetic trait, but it's 
it they're missing some combination of pigment that the scientists call <laughs> leucism that makes them white, but their eyes stay black, stay normal color. Which makes them far less creepy. Far less creepy. I like lucidic animals. I, I've seen um, uh, a fair amount of lions and tigers that show up white, and I think they're, mm. they're lucidic. I think that sounds good. <laughs> but what, what do you think, Clay? Well, I was doing a little, little looking around, and I read... Uh, this is from, I think uh, it was from the Department of Natural Resources in Virginia, that oftentimes as as catfish age, uh, they will they will change color a little bit. So the blue cats will whiten up uh, and they look a lot like channel cats, like an older channel cat. Um, and that's what their website said. So as they get older, they change and sometimes people mix them up because the colors fade off of them. So that's another possibility. So they're just washed out. Yeah, they're old. It's like getting gray hairs. <laughs> <You know? laughs> All right. So my initial my initial response before I did any reading was, I always I always look at animals and, and looking at fish especially. Uh, I think color is the worst guide for identifying a fish, yep. and I think it's a big mistake to to use fish use color as as your identifying tool because of just natural variation and mutation. Like they're gonna there's gonna be variation. And so there's a lot of other traits that you want to use for judging your fish, you know, scale shapes and scale counts and all that kind of stuff. So don't let color distract you. Boy, that, that's, a, that's a very, racist. yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, that's a we are the world kind of. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's hold fins and sing songs. <laughs> <laughs> Fish in the news. Love fish in the fish news. Fish in the news. We've got news from NBC News. Mm. I know. It's like real news. Real news. Um, so, the headline reads, To study evolution, scientists raise fish that walk on land. Mm. Hmm, sounds intriguing, Interesting. right? Interesting. It does. I, You know, I, I really want to see how, how fish, like... Like, how do you raise a fish that way? I know. So, real quick, the research talks about, you know, there's an unusual fish and blah, blah, blah. And they're working with a fish called a bachir or bachir. 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 Um, African fish, I believe. Yep. And uh, air breathing has lungs. Sounds like a lung fish to me, but I, I think they are a little different. They're a, little, they're a lot scalier. Um, right. And than a lung fish, I think. But uh, but they're they're super cute. They are very cute. They're sort of uh, yeah. I don't know. They're sort of like uh, ET ish. Yeah. And uh, aliens. Sure enough, they walk on on land. They can breathe like many fish can um, out of water, yeah. and walk around. Um, yeah. What, what other fish? What other fish can walk on land and breathe out of water? Mud skippers. Mud skippers. Yeah. American eels. American eels. Walking catfish. Yep, and many more. Many, many, <laughs> many more. A bowfin probably could, could pull off. Probably, yeah, a bunch of them. And some fish can just, like, you can even take a catfish, and if it's wet out, they could be out of water for, you know, a day or so, and it's probably just fine. Yeah, got to keep them moist, but yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that's what I was thinking. Do they build these cages with, like, misting sprayers? or? I don't Like, know. if they're raising this fish entirely out of water. <laughs> they are. They're raising, logistically, they're raising fish on land versus fish raised in the water. Yeah, and so then they're these fish are adapting to being on land. Yes, and so they're changing how they move because they have to adapt, right? Right. So the shape of their body becomes a little bit different. They hold themselves up a little bit taller and stuff. Yep. And scientists are saying this gives them clues to how fish have evolved, right? That's what they're saying. Yeah, I think that's crap <laughs> <laughs> because that's not how evolution works. Right. Evolution. This whole idea is all based on like random mutation, right? Right. So if the fish was born with a mutation that made him better able to stand up right and walk on land, and then that made it better able to reproduce, then that trait would get passed on. But if you take a fish and you like teach it already, it's already the genes are already set in place, yep. and you teach it to move differently, it can't pass on what it's learned. You can't pass on acquired traits. That's it's too Lamarckian. Lamarckian, ooh, Lamarckian. Yes, yeah, so who taught science for you know? A year. 
But you know who Lamarck was, right? I don't. Who was Lamarck? So he was the dude. This is before Darwin. Mm-hmm. He said that the reason giraffes have a long neck is because they had to reach really high, stretch their neck to grab a branch from a tree to eat. So the little giraffe would stretch real hard, Got it. and it would grow, you know, a tenth of an inch or whatever, yep. and over generations, that trait would stick and just be longer each generation. And he used fossil records to show this. Hmm. Um, but that does not how, that's not how it works. Not how it works, huh? It, it has to be... Genetic, it can't be acquired by that trait. By that same thing is like you play drums, right? I do. Right, and did you know how to play drums before your daughter was born? I did not. Oh wait, yes, oh, I did. You yes, learned. I did. You did <laughs> yeah. before. Before I, yeah, before your kid was born, you knew how to play drums. That is true. Right? Yes. So when she was born, if you use this article as your guide for teaching and learning evolution, then in by that same argument, she'd be able to play drums, which she does play drums. But before she learned. <laughs> She'd have come out ready to play drums. <laughs> I, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. So actually, you're. But it's cute and fun. It's a fun science experiment that teaches you very little. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good story. It's funny, and it's and the fish are super fun to look at. Yeah, there's little so videos. I mean, and you go in too, right? Yeah, and I'm gonna, I'm going to read the actual full report, and I'll report back next week because it's also possible, Dave. But I'm wrong. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? It's a distinct possibility. Yeah. So I'll take a read on the full report and I'll, I'll report back next week. Very nice. Oh, it's that time again with Doc Martin talking fish. Hi, Erica. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. How are you guys? <laughs> we're, we're doing good. We're doing good. It's been a long time. It has been, been a long, long time. time. We, you, t- you took a summer break. I did. Well, moving break, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Were, were you able to do any fishing during that time? Uh, uh, technically, yes. Successfully, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> we, we know how you feel. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so what's on the docket tonight for the Fish Nerd Minute? Um, tonight we're going to be talking about the shovel nose sturgeon. Oh, mm. so cool. Uh, well, first of all, the scientific name is really fun to say. So it, it's Scaphorhynchus platyrhynchus. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just silly. It sounds, sounds like a little jazz tune, you know? It could be. Scaphorhynchus platyrhynchus. Scaphorhynchus <laughs> platyrhynchus. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, that's fine. I, I like it. N- never never do that again. <laughs> um, Dave's but... got no soul. He really shouldn't get any jazz. <laughs> it's not part of his family history. <laughs> oh, the sturgeon, the shovel-nosed sturgeon, uh, well, its scientific name, the Scaphorhynchus platyrhynchus, yay, is, yeah, it means, uh, Scaphorhynchus means boat snout, and platyrhynchus <laughs> means broad snout. <laughs> So, uh, as you can imagine, the snout of the shovel-nosed sturgeon is broad and boat-like or shovel-like. So, nice. if you put your hands and make a, a triangle, if you guys are Jay-Z fans, you can do the hova or whatever he calls himself. Um, what? what? Are you a Jay-Z fan? <laughs> it's Jay-Z. Who's Jay-Z. Come on. We're old. <laughs> I don't understand any of that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, put your thumbs together so the okay. tips touch, and then your pointer fingers together so that they touch, and you make a triangle. Okay, thumbs are together. And pointer fingers are together. Oh, yeah. You've made a triangle. Yeah. So that is really what their snout looks like. It's a it's a triangle, and it is sharp. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's shovel nose. Like, it's very aptly named. <laughs> As a result of the sturgeon being bottom feeders... It's a host to the larvae of several species of freshwater mussels. Oh. Mm-hmm. So the, these freshwater mussels, a lot of them, um, is, it's the only known host to the hickory nut mussel. So without uh, shovel-nosed sturgeons, you wouldn't have any hickory nut mussels in your stream. So, so these guys are still in the class Actinopterygii, which are the ray fin fishes. However, they're in a pretty cool order, which is Acipenseriformes, and that just means they're the primitive ray finned fishes. So these guys have been around for a really, really long time uh, in evolutionary time, and it includes the sturgeons as well as the paddlefish. The shovel nosed sturgeon poaching is becoming a problem because they have to be eight 
to 10 years old before they can spawn, and females only are gravid once every three years. Yeah. So you said you said 40 years is about right for them? Um, for the pallid sturgeon, it's about 40. The shovel nose is going to be a little bit less than that. They're not qu- they don't get quite as large. So the size of the fish impacts the age, like how long it lives? Yeah, actually, there's a great correlation between longevity um, and age of maturity um, and the number of young you have. It's it's called the, the uh, trilateral continuum. <laughs> Is that with all fish? Um, yeah, they, uh, they actually ran it, I believe, on most freshwater and I think some marine fish. Um, mm-hmm. They've done it in several uh, different uh, regions. Of the world and marine, freshwater, North America, and stuff like that, to see if all these fishes do in fact fit into this so called trilateral continuum. And it's actually still highly debated now, which is pretty cool. It came out in 1992 by Wine, Miller, and Rose. And I would say, in, in general, for the fishes that tend to cluster at those extreme end points, it works really well. But there are a few uh, weirdo fish that kind of don't really fit into one of the categories. Um, sturgeon like, would definitely be like, at one of the apexes of that. Yeah, well, it's interesting. You always ask me for recipes. Oh, yeah, let's hear it. So this is, uh, I figured we'd have a little bit of, of a country and a little bit of rock and roll here. We got a PBR and caviar. <laughs> <laughs> nice. What? How, how do you make that? Uh, so you, you need uh, four slices of white bread, some sour cream, Caviar, one hard-boiled egg, some chives, and uh, some cheap beer, which a PBR would would fit there. Yep. And then um, you you take your caviar out of the fridge and you warm it up a little bit while you make the toast. Then you cut off the crusts if you're that kind of person. <laughs> and then you place the egg in the middle of your toast and put the uh, toast kind of in little pieces around. Um, in a circle yeah. and then you have a little bit of sour cream on each piece of toast and uh then they should stick together pretty well so you got this toast sour cream row little sandwich and you sprinkle some chives on top and if you want you can place that a little bit of the hard boiled egg and uh, you serve immediately with very cold bland beer <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a little piece of horrible <laughs> Wow, the shovel nose sturgeon. Who knew? Who knew there was so much interesting, cool stuff about those? So, Doc Martin, once again, thanks for schooling us on another fish species. Well, you sure are welcome. I can't wait to do it again next week. <laughs> Yay! Yay! <laughs> That is it. You've listened to a couple of fish nerds when you could have been fishing. (coughs) (laughs) We (laughs) we'd like to thank our families for supporting us while we podcast, go on fishing quests, and do all sorts of silly things that middle aged guys do. If you would like to support the fish nerds, you can go to patreon.com slash fish nerds and help us crowdfund this show. Special thanks. Oh, I have skunks outside right now. Oh, God. <laughs> Special thanks yeah. to Captain Sean Tibbetts from the fishing vessel Miss Megan 2 for making that shark trip possible. Check his shark fishing and tuna fishing trips and all sorts of fishing trips out at www.maintunafishing.com. And until next time, follow the code of the fish nerd. Spawn early and often. Avoid free lunches with strings attached. Head swim against the current every chance you get. <laughs> 